So welcome everyone. Today we'll have talk of uh, Piotr Kolenderski, who completed his uh, PhD studies at Nikolaus Copernicus University in Poland. In Poland. Then uh, in 2010, uh, he moved for three years for his postdoc at the Institute for Quantum Computing in Waterloo, Canada, as a winner of the Mobility Plus program. And since 2013, he's working in Poland uh, in so-called FAMO, and Institute of Physics. FAMO is the National Laboratory of Atomic, Molecular and Optical Physics, which was established by many institutions that decided to cooperate, to develop broadly understood quantum optics in Poland. And quickly they managed to uh, generate the first Bose-Einstein condensation in Poland, first Bose-Einstein condensate. There is also some recent success they achieved a new generation of atomic clocks, so-called optical clocks. And uh, Piotr Kolenderski directs their, this is SPA laboratory, which is single photon application laboratory. And he's mastering uh, generation of a single photons, of single photons, then uh, detection and, uh, and application of them. And uh, probably today he will tell us about a single photon uh, devices. So Piotr, the screen is yours. Okay, uh, thank you for, in, uh, for the invitation and for the introduction. So I'm guessing I can skip a couple of uh, first slides for, uh, which I <laughs> prepared for, for introduction, but let's, let's do that very briefly. So I, I work at uh, Nikolaus Copernicus University at which we have FAMOLAB and FAMOLAB actually consists of a few smaller laboratories and one of them uh, I named single photon applications laboratory. So this is the lab that um, I'm responsible uh, for. Um, okay, so as Krzysiek um, told us already uh, at National Laboratory of Atomic Molecular and Optical Physics, we have optical atomic clock, actually two of them. Uh, there is also high resolution optical uh, spectroscopy, which is quite important here there are ion traps and the, the, the fourth uh, laboratory is single photon is devoted to single photon uh, applications um, in my lab um, there is actually two main uh, branches of of research that i uh, I, I like to develop and i like to work on with um, with my younger colleagues so uh, one of them is related to um, co communication. It is both classical and quantum communication. And the other one is related to photon atom interaction. Um, both of them are the, the common denominator of both of those applications uh, are single photon uh, sources and uh, single photon uh, detection techniques. So uh, let's say, roughly speaking, uh, we generate single photons, we can generate fo uh, entangled photon pairs, and uh, here we have um, micro and here we have micro uh, applications. Uh, today, uh, I will focus on um, quantum com on communication um, in actually two parts. So there is two parts of, of my talk. First part is going to be related to fiber links and uh, the second part uh, to satellite uh, communication. And it's gonna be both classical and, uh, and quantum. And this is uh, actually a SPA laboratory during the pandemia. So actually half of, of the laboratory. So as you can see, almost everything is switched off and no people inside, but uh, but recently we, we started to work, work again uh, with some very severe uh, restrictions of, of one person in the lab uh, at one time. Okay, anyway, so sorry for complaining. Uh, so let's, let's begin with uh, part uh, one, which is related to fiber links. So um, I work on applications of uh, single photons. Uh, so, and single photon sources uh, these days, actually for me also, are like uh, lasers um, in another laboratory. So this is this is 
um, a tool that one can use for uh, other purposes, like similar like like lasers. So these days you can even uh, buy. There, there is at least three companies which can um, provide um, single photon uh, sources or entangled photon uh, sources as well. Okay, so what is the application that um, we have in mind? Uh, actually, what is the application that we want to want our single photon sources you know, to be applied? So uh, cryptography is one of those applications, which is, I would say, most obvious and which is uh, the application that um, is very close uh, to the commercial uh, sector. So um, briefly and roughly speaking, if there is Alice, actually I would like to introduce my two actors, which is Alice and Bob as, as, as always. So let's assume that Alice wants to write a message and send this message to Bob and she does not want anyone, and they do not want anyone uh, to learn about this message. So what they can do, they can uh, use a cryptographic method to uh, encode information. So they can, Alice can use her key in order to encode message. Then she can send it to Bob. Bob then decrypts the message using his key and he can read uh, the message. Um, okay, so this is something that um, almost yeah, most of us, actually all of us, uh, do all the time. Uh, browsers work like this. Um, so if this is, let's say, asymmetric type of cryptography, then those two keys are uh, different. So that would be a public key, and this is going to be a um, private key. And the security of this uh, framework um, is based on the assumption that a potential eavesdropper does not have enough compute computation power to actually decrypt the message, crack the key. But if uh, we resort to another uh, cryptographic uh, method, which is um, symmetric uh, cryptography, and within this method, uh, both uh, those keys are uh, the same, uh, then we can have something which is, uh, yeah, absolute, we can, we can have absolute uh, security of uh, the encryption, um, of the encryption of, of, of our message. But the problem is that those two keys needs to be identical and those two keys, actually this is one key, uh, needs to be known only to Alice and Bob. So at some point they would have to meet and establish the key. But the problem is how to do that, how to establish the key without uh, meeting with uh, each other. Uh, so there is a method which is called quantum key distribution, which is um, based on, well, actually one of the implementation, and actually the only implementation is based on uh, sending single photons from Alice to Bob and um, measuring those uh, those photons. And there is uh, lots of different protocols how to establish a key uh, using um, such an implementation. And here, of course, no cloning theorem is the origin of, of the security because any um, attempt to measure a photon would leave a trace. So then Alice and Bob can know that there was someone who, who tried to um, learn about about the key. Okay, so yeah, this is <laughs> this is one of the papers actually um, the one that I like the most about uh, about the no no cloning theorem. So this is a theorem that is actually the proof is very very, very simple. So I'm guessing uh, many of us teach that uh, students at some at some point. Okay, so um, I work on both theory and experiments uh, related to single photons. Um, so what is the, uh, here is the slide about the basic apparatus or the basic um, um, 
uh, the, uh, the basic phenomenon that we use to generate uh, single photons, which is spontaneous parametric down conversion. So um, here we have a nonlinear medium. Um, and the scenario is the following. There is a single photon which, which when traveling in the nonlinear medium, can decay into spontaneously into a, a pair of, of photons. And then if one photon, and then one photon can be either fiber coupled or sent by a telescope to Aries, and then the other one can be sent to, uh, to Bob. Um, and okay, I, 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 I said that there is a single photon traveling through the nonlinear medium, but I was talking about the one that was lucky enough to decay into a pair of photons because the probability to, uh, of this decay process is of the order of 10 to minus 10. In the best case, this is 10 to minus six. So this is very, um, uh, very weak uh, process. In practice, sometimes you can see that in the lab. So here you can see a very powerful uh, laser beam uh, which illuminates a nonlinear crystal, which is of which is of the size of uh, which size is of the order of few few millimeters, few millimeters by few millimeters by few millimeters, and then the most of the pump makes it through, but there are some photons which actually build um, a cone, and then if we if we put fibers here and here, then we can couple um those pairs in the some fraction of those pairs which are generated in uh, single mode fibers okay so let's get back again to applications so the application is um actually we want to use a photon pair source uh, for quantum key distribution this is our quantum communication uh, protocol so this one is based on fibers, so we couple photons in uh, in one fiber and um, the other photon in, into the other fiber, and the, the other uh, the fiber ends are then in Alice and Bob's uh, uh, laboratory. Then I assume that we can perform a standard QKD protocol like VB84 or or Eckert uh, protocol or, or any other, which is based on polarization degree of freedom. Um, and what are the problems in real life? Uh, in real life, we have uh, real detectors, real single photon detectors, which uh, have dark counts. So they click even, there, even if there was no photon. Uh, there is also, uh, okay, uh, those detectors, they can, um, tell us about the arrival time of, uh, of um, the photon, but there is a timing jitter, which is the uncertainty of the arrival time. And uh, the timing jitter is um, mostly related to the design of the detector and also the electronics. Um, the detectors can be very efficient in terms of uh, photon detection efficiency. Um, so the quantum efficiency can be quite high, but it is still not uh, not one. It can be 90 uh, something uh, percent in, in these days. But anyway, the problem is actually uh, with dark counts and quantum efficiency. So if we want to, let's, let's get back to this, uh, uh, to this um, figure. So if we want to uh, establish a quantum communication link between Elise and Bob, we need to uh, have ability to detect, detect real photons and we don't want to see an, an noise which originates mainly in uh, dark counts. So um, if- Sorry, but your, your photon uh, source is not a source on demand. It's producing these pairs randomly. If you had them on demand, then these dark counts would be less relevant. Exactly, and th th that's gonna be my point in five minutes. Actually. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, we can generate those photons using a pulsed laser. So then we have um, a time reference. Uh, so this is one one one, um, one way to actually tell when actually to, to tell the detectors when to expect a photon. So let's let's assume that this line here, this Gauss, 
resembles the um, probability amplitude uh, of a photon detection. So our detection window should be as, um, as large, uh, as long as the duration of the photon, I would say, right? So we, we need to uh, apply something which is called uh, temporal filtering. So we, we need to narrow down the detection window. So the narrower the detection window, the lower the noise because we have uh, lower chances to detect um, dark count within that, within that window. Okay, but there is another advantage of using, um, of using photon pairs uh, because uh, we have entanglement, we have polarization entanglement, which allows us to um, uh, perform a QKD or um, a quantum communication protocol, but we can also use uh, frequency, frequency entanglement, a spectral entanglement to actually narrow down the detection window even, even more. How is that possible? Okay, so let's assume that this is the probability density, uh, pro pro uh, uh, probability amplitude of uh, related to the spectral part of, of uh, my biphoton, uh, which is uh, one is here and the other photon is here. Um, this is a, a simplification. So I assume that this is a um, double Gaussian distribution. Um, this is very useful because then we have three parameters and one is the most important, which is the correlation. So we can have, uh, just a second, so we can have a negative correlation. So it means that the higher energy, uh, the lower energy photon is correlated with the higher energy photon and vice versa. If there is no correlation, so then there is no, no such a relation here. And then uh, we can also generate photons which are positively correlated. So it means that the lower energy photon is correlated with the no, uh, lower energy photon. Uh, uh, and so on. And this is not against uh, energy conservation relation because uh, this case is possible only when we use a pulsed laser. And the pulsed laser has not, uh, uh, does not have well uh, defined um, frequency. So there is a frequency spectrum in, in that laser. So um, then uh, let, let, let's assume that we have this kind of, uh, sorry, let's assume that we have this kind of uh, photon pairs uh, generated by, by this source. Then if the photons propagate through long fiber, um, uh, the fiber transform the photons um, because that there is a dispersion uh, in, in the fibers. So the they, they wave packet is getting larger and larger. So this is, this is actually the problem that most of us solve um, on the first quantum mechanics course. So this is, this is a wave packet propagation in, in, in actually free space. The mathematics is, the, is, is exactly the same. But anyway, in the end, if we have long fiber and time stamping uh, unit, uh, which is connected to single photon detector, then we can, we, we can measure these uh, joint spectra, so the spectrum of, of first and second fo photon in the temporal domain, in the time, in, in the time domain. Uh, why it is uh, important, why it is related to, 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 to this uh, matter? Um, because uh, if we have only the time reference from our laser, then this would be the uh, distribution of the photons of arrival time of the photons on Alice's side, and that would be uh, the distribution of arrival times on, on Bob's side. Uh, again, uh, with respect to the past laser to, to our um, time uh, reference. But if we have ability to uh, say what was the arrival time of the photons on both sides, then Alice can actually uh, filter, can only select those photons which are, let's say, around zero with, um, let's say, the width of uh, 100 picoseconds uh, as in this uh, ex um, example um, experiment. And then those detections will correspond to uh, these detections on, Bob, on Bob's side. 
So as you see, if we have this additional information on Alice's side, then this um, arrival time distribution on Bob's side is much narrower. In this uh, um, experiment, uh, in this experiment, in this ex experimental um, example, the narrowing is of the order of 30%. So this is the way to actually uh, overcome or reduce, because this is not a total um, solution, to reduce the problem with, um, with noise and how it is related to uh, the range or the efficiency of quantum key distribution. So if we, uh, if we uh, work with uh, QKD, then there is one parameter that is very important, which is key generation rate. So this plot shows the key generation rate in a function of the link distance. So this is the distance on this side and, uh, and this side. So if we, if we don't use any correlation, if we use photons, which have the same spectra, but no correlation, then let's say that um, if, if uh, the distance is uh, defined at the level of um, 10 to minus eight, the key distribution, the, the, the key rate, then it is of the order of, let's say uh, 150 kilometers. But then if we use that additional information related to the arrival time, then we can extend um, the range of the quantum key distribution uh, even up to uh, 190 kilometers. So, so this is of the order of uh, 30, 40 uh, kilometers uh, further. Uh, there is a few more curves here because let's say th those two those this pair and this pair is related to a positive and negative correlation, but one of them uses additional um, one more information, uh, which is related to the arrival time of uh, sorry um, to the external reference frame uh, coming from the laser parse, and the other does not. Okay, so this is one um, one um, particular application. So here we actually uh, proposed this method uh, in this paper and we implemented, uh, we actually reported on the experimental results uh, in this paper. So summarizing this um, short part, this section, let's say, um, we use polarization entanglement for implementation of uh, quantum, uh, uh, quantum communication. And we use a spectral entanglement to uh, to improve the eff efficiency or the maximal distance of uh, quantum communication uh, protocol. Um, we also investigated the case when um, the source is in Alice's uh, laboratory. And this analysis came with a surprise because at the beginning we, we thought that uh, fibers are, are no good uh, for, <laughs> for communication because uh, of two, two features. One feature is this is dispersive medium, so they have dispersion, and um, of course they have loss. Um, the loss is minimized because telecom guys they they did lots of yeah the, <laughs> there was lots of effort to to make it as as low as possible, but there is still a loss. But what was the surprise? So let's assume that the distance between Alice and Bob uh, is of the order of two hundred. Uh, kilometers. So then um, it, uh, it turned out that we need a bit of fiber and actually quite a lot on Alice's, in Alice's laboratory, because if there is not enough uh, fiber, then we don't have uh, any key, uh, any possibility to generate a key. If there is too much of the fiber, uh, once again, the key generation rate is not, not possible. So there is a well-defined range of uh, the fiber, the length of the fiber that needs to, that is actually um, um, a co condition, a prerequisite to, uh, for QKD. So the physical interpretation is the following. So here, if we don't have enough fiber, then we don't have enough temporal resolution uh, we don't have enough uh, dispersion and temporal resolution to actually use 
the time uh, filtering. And if we have too much of the fiber, then uh, we have too much of loss and the advantage of uh, temporal resolution um, does, not, does not help uh, anymore. And yeah, that was presented in this uh, theoretical uh, paper a while ago. So with what is length scales? Excuse is me. There, there, an there is an optimal length of the fiber? Yes, the, the, there is uh, actually so opt, uh, what, what range with of the other, of So with what source quantity it scales? It depends so, on the signal you are sending, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is uh, everything is uh, optimized for a certain uh, features of the photons which which we use. So for different uh, characteristics of of SPDC photons of photon pairs, that that would be that would be different, uh, different uh, different numbers. Uh, I would say. Did, did I answer your question? Right. Sort of, yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, so uh, we, we, we have a, a measurement apparatus uh, in the lab, which is the ability to uh, generate single photons and also to detect single photons and also to detect them with uh, a very high uh, time resolution. So we also proposed um, a framework of measuring photons based on um, another framework, which is called time beam encoding. So let me uh, walk you through uh, this idea. So let's let's begin with with panel A. Uh, let, let's assume that I have a single photon and I have two, uh, yeah, sorry, wave packets. But um, I would rather. Uh, Okay, whenever I, I say wave packet or single photon uh, wave packet, I, I mean uh, probability amplitude for a single photon because there are some, some problems with the definition of, of uh, single photon wave packet, uh, single photon wave function. So I, I, I use the, op, um, um, uh, how to say, operational um, meaning of uh, single photon wave packet or single photon wave function. Okay, so let's assume that I have uh, this wave packet and then a, neighbor, an, a neighboring uh, wave, packet, wave packet here. Let's assume that uh, they are Gaussian and they are uh, close to each other. So then I can define a wave, uh, a, a, a vector, which is defined here, which I say this is zero and another one, which I, which I, uh, which I uh, define and label with, with one. Of course, those, those detectors with this definition are not or orthogonal, but I can, um, okay, in theory, uh, they are not orthogonal, but for experimentalists, they can be orthogonal. Why can I say like that? Because if the distance between these two wave packets uh, is at least four times uh, greater as the width of those wave packets, this is of the order of 0.1%, uh, uh, this, uh, this overlap. So for, uh, so experimentally, those two um, uh, vectors are orthogonal. Okay, so this, is, so this is my qubit. I have one photon, which is the localized here, and I can encode uh, an qubit. Um, so let's say I can have a situation that we've probability amplitude alpha zero, I have a photon here, and with probability amplitude alpha one, I have a photon here. So my perfect detector, if there is no timing jitter, would measure uh, this quantity, right? So that would be the probability uh, density distribution that my uh, single photon detector uh, can measure when I repeat uh, the measurement. So this measurement is, of course, after propagating this, uh, this, um, this state, this wave packet, through long fiber. So it means that uh, those, uh, those two wave packets, they, they start to overlap. And then I have um, an image, which uh, a plot, which resembles um, interference pattern, because this is actually interference of those two, two wave packets. 
Okay, so this is, uh, let's say, experimental, uh, experimental point of view, or, um, point of view of the experimentalist. But we can rewrite this equation such that this is a trace of an operator acting on the state, on the density operator uh, related to, to the initial state um, of, of my photon. So if I, if I define like the, if I redefine or rewrite this expression like this, then I have to use these two definitions, right? And, um, and also um, this state, which actually builds my operator, which I call P of E M. Uh, why can I call, call it like that? Because this is related to, 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 the, to actual measurement. And um, when, I, when I draw um, those states on the block sphere, then I have a kind of spiral here. So you, you, you can also see that um, there is that color scaling. So the color scaling uh, is related to the weight of my P of EM. So more red, more probable, uh, more blue, less probable. So all of those points in the abstract Broch sphere are related to those points which my detector can measure. So this is a way to actually uh, perform any quantum mechanical task. So we can do um, tomography, we can do phase estimation uh, within, this, uh, with this, within this framework. So actually the tomography and phase estimation, this is something that we have already uh, done and presented in those two theoretical papers. Uh, we, that experiment is actually uh, running as we speak. And we also have some ideas how to uh, use this framework for quantum key uh, distribution. Okay, so this is something that we have uh, in lab. Uh, this is a technology that we can use for, for QKD. Uh, what are the other implementations? So uh, there are two, uh, let's say, very famous implementation or uh, field implementation of uh, quantum key distribution. Those are uh, based on uh, polarization degree of freedom. So one uh, one is here in Europe. Uh, this is the, let's say, backbone in, in, um, in Italy. And uh, actually the, the most uh, famous is um, in China. Uh, that, that link is of the order of 2000 kilometers. So as you can see, there is lots of nodes here. Uh, so typical distance between those two nodes is of the order of 100 uh, kilometers. So this is because of the um, uh, properties of, of the um, transmission medium, which is fiber. So the idea is to actually uh, increase the range of quantum communication protocols, uh, resorting to other um, possibilities like, uh, like satellites. So what people and what we can do uh, in, in this lab uh, in order to make it to, to make the quantum communication protocols um, to, to, to increase the range of quantum communication protocols and in, in order to increase its efficiency. So let's let's get back to classical communication because this is this is actually the, the technology that we can build on. So typically um, if we use our phones or computers, uh, there is a radio communication with, with an antenna. Uh, and then when there are two antennas, they are typically uh, connected using optical fiber. So there is radio communication here and uh, optical communication here. Uh, this is because the transmission rate for the radio uh, communication is much lower as compared to optical communication. So this, this is a known fact. Um, in terms of satellites, uh, for the com communication is also <laughs> actually it's, it's, it's very important. Um, the most of the sat existing satellites, there is lots of them these days, uh, they use uh, radio frequency as a communication channel. Uh, so the frequency is um, between 3 and 31 uh, gigahertz. This is, this is a kind of standard 
for the communication with the, with the satellite. So RF communication is the standard, but um, there is um, there are some applications which need um, um, better or higher transmission rates. So that's why optical links between um, satellites and ground stations uh, are being developed. There was one, um, uh, I would say, spectacular um, uh, demonstration of su such a link um, by NASA. It was around 2015. And the mission was, uh, actually, the link was between a satellite which was orbiting around uh, a moon and the ground station which was uh, in White Sands, uh, USA. Uh, they showed that uh, transfer speed, uh, the, the uplink of 20 uh, megabits per second was possible and downlink with uh, six, uh, 622 megabits per second was, was also possible. And uh, yeah, the distance, that was over the distance of 400, around 400,000 kilometers at 1550 uh, nanometers. So um, this is actually spectacular and very pricey mission, but um, also uh, the, 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 there was also a um, demonstration by, by, by NASA, uh, which showed that even at low orbit uh, using a CubeSat, which is, which is very small, this is 1.5, this is of the one U, one unit is uh, 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. That, that, that's a small, uh, such a small cube. So using th this, is, this, is, this picture shows two such a sat satellites, which were uh, used in order to demonstrate that the optical communication between LEO sat satellite and ground station is possible. So they, they used these uh, satellites. They used optical on-off keying, so all through K, as engineers like to, like to say uh method which is uh, which is actually not not a new method because this is this is just uh, yeah so, sorry for saying that but this is just blinking with uh, with a laser light so this is very this is an idea known from 1838 if i remember correctly that was the date when morse alphabet uh, was invented and this idea is still still here but the equipment is more uh, sophisticated uh, yeah, in terms of equipment, um, a few lasers, let's say like um, a, a, a master laser and a pump laser are um, required for that. So the, let's say the master laser uh, controls the, um, the pump, the pumping uh, laser in order to uh, prepare those uh, flashes of, of light. So this is on the, on the satellite, uh, on board of the satellite. This is the payload of the of the satellite and on the ground station, this is something that astronomers use uh, almost on the daily basis with some additional uh, equipment. So this is a telescope which was uh, 40 centimeters of diameter and it was uh, fully uh, robotic. Okay, so that is for the LEO um, uh, orbit, which is, um, around uh, 500 kilometers um, above the surface of, of Earth. Um, the advantage is that those missions are relatively inexpensive or cheaper as compared to moon missions. But uh, the disadvantage is such that the satellite is usually visible at the ground station for, um, for the time of the order of 10 minutes. So in 10 minutes, uh, whatever we want to do with the satellite needs to happen. So an optical or quantum communication needs to happen within those 10 minutes. And then the satellite travels to another place, um, hopefully to, the, to, to another ground station that we want to uh, perform communication with. So this is the problem. But uh, there is a huge project by ESA, which is Inter-Satellite Data, Data Relay System. Uh, which idea is presented on, uh, on this um, slide. So there is a geo satellite which is sitting there all the time and, he, and can communicate using radio frequency with a ground station. 
So those two points, uh, this link is operational all the time. And there is a, there can be lots of LEO satellites which are orbiting very uh, frequently um, the Earth, but the LEO satellite and these geo satellite, they have optical communication link. So it means that uh, the data rate between these two guys is, is um, very fast and the geo satellite can see uh, LEO satellite over half of its journey uh, uh, around the earth. So this is the advantage. So actually the satellite actually uploads all its data to geosatellite and then geosatellite slowly um, uploads or <laughs> let's say downloads uh, that the data to uh, to the ground um, to the ground station okay so that was uh, classical uh, communication it means that we blink with uh, laser uh, pulses for uh, quantum communication we need single photons um, and if we have ability to uh, send or exchange single photon between a ground station and a satellite, we can perform a quantum communication protocol. So in these days, we focus on quantum key distribution. So how, how, how does it work? Um, actually, the recipe is uh, presented here. So let's assume that we can establish single photon uh, link between uh, a satellite and the ground station and we exchange key number one and then the satellite flies to the other uh, station and then uh, between this station and the satellite another key is exchanged key number two so then we, uh, the satellite can use any other communication link like radio frequency or optical or classical optical link in order to send encrypted key number one to uh, ground station number two. So actually the satellite uses um, key number two to encrypt key number one and send it to ground station number two. And after that, ground station number one and the ground station number two, they have um, the same, um, the same um, key, quantum key. Which can they, which then they can use for uh, cryptography. Another idea or another project by ESA is so-called uh, SAGA mission, which is security and cryptographic mission. And the idea, yeah, so, sorry, maybe one more comment. This mission is um, relatively inexpensive in the sense that those satellites are rather cheap and uh, the single photon sources here uh, can be just attenuated lasers. So actually the, the, this mission is simple and relati relatively simple and relatively cheap. Uh, but uh, there are- But there must be tremendous losses between the ground station and the satellite. Yeah, there is 10 to minus four roughly. So, so um, 40 dB of attenuation between these two uh, yeah. guys. That's right. And uh, yeah, yeah, so that, 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 that's the problem. Uh, okay, so here we have a single photon source. Uh, so there, there must be some, some, some more assumptions uh, in order to have secure communication, right? But if we want um, a situation in which we have device independent uh, quantum key distribution, then we, we need to use um, entanglement. So we can use, uh, so, uh, we can use um, photon pair source and one photon goes to Alice and one photon goes to Bob. And the, the, the assumption of uh, Sagan mission is that this single phot uh, photon pair source is actually as a payload of a geo satellite. And this geo satellite actually illuminates with those photons uh, the ground station of Ellis and Bob. And this is, I would say, serious mission because this is a yeah, geo satellite is really uh, expensive. And th thank you for that comment because now the losses are even worse because uh, that was uh, here, it was around 10 to minus uh, four and here we have around 10 to minus six. So it's, it's, it's even worse. 
uh, it's, it's worse and it's even more difficult because th those losses, the, the loss scales quadratically because we have two photons. So <laughs> there is loss in this channel and also in this channel. So that, that's why it, this, is, this is very, very difficult. Uh, nevertheless, Chinese uh, group already showed that this is possible. So actually they, uh, they presented, they proved that um, a few quantum communication protocols are, are, are possible. Uh, one of them is actually presented here on this, uh, on this slide. So they proved that they can establish a quantum a key, so the key for for uh, symmetric cryptography between three ground stations, and one of that ground station was in China, and the other one was was in Europe. And then they they showed that um, this key can be used uh, for classical communication between these two between these two uh, parties. And also that they also, uh, by the way, they, they also showed that entanglement swapping and, uh, is possible and um, that this kind of cryptography is also uh, possible. Okay, so what do we do in Poland? Um, there is, I would say, three projects. Two, are all, all, uh, two of them are running. So one is... Uh, so this is uh, here in Poland. This is uh, um, in a partner partnership with Nikolaus Kopernikus uh, Astronomical Center in, in Warsaw. Uh, this is uh, Ma Maciej Konacki uh, is involved in, in this project. So there is going to be uh, a ground station in South Africa for actually two uh, purposes. One is the um, space debris, debris uh, monitoring gonna be uh, to use a quantum communication mo module uh, to communicate with a satellite which is gonna be available in uh, three years um, by uh, Institute for uh, from Institute for, for Quantum Computing. So here we will actually study the uplink configuration. So the quantum com uh, quantum communication module is going to be sitting on the ground station and will be sending photons towards the satellite um, for, this, uh, for this application. Okay, and uh, so th 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 this project is running. So, we <laughs> so there is no results at this uh, moment, uh, except that, that uh, we already have uh, single photon sources for uh, this application in the lab and we are in process of um, improving those those sources for the specific uh, link uh, requirements. Another project uh, which is in the par partnership with uh, a company uh, from Gdańsk, this is Sideral Polska, is related to a satellite entanglement controller because if the uh, photon pair source is going to be mounted on a geo satellite and that there needs to be an electronic controller which is going to be in charge of um, working with, with optics in the sense that it should control um, the optical elements and the quality of entanglement uh, on the geo satellite. So uh, the company, Sidera Polska, uh, is in charge of um, producing electronics for a photon pair source. Uh, I was in charge of uh, providing um, optical setup, which can be, um, how to say, connected to their electronics in order to check if the electronics work. But uh, my source was not um, intended to be space qualified at this moment. So the source is classical in the sense that uh, it's not space qualified, but the electronics is going to be space qualified. And um, also Gdańsk, uh, yeah, Gdańsk Univers Univer University of Gdańsk is involved uh, in uh, providing uh, um, effective algorithms to control and stabilize and align the source on the, on the orbit. So actually, uh, we accomplished the first uh, first stage of this project, 
so I, I actually provided the, the source and the uh, electronics is uh, now connected to optics and the next stage is gonna be uh, testing the quality for, of polarization entanglement in the source. And the project number of number three. So this is this is uh, that's this is a kind of plans, right? So so uh, it's not running uh, now, but it was official by uh, our partner by Exatel. So by the way, Exatel is our national um, uh, telecom provider. They they for example. Um, provide 111, uh, 112 number, um, emergency uh, number. So they are responsible for, for that number and many other uh, tele fiber uh, communication um, uh, services in Poland. And the idea is to, to actually um, build together a satellite, which is gonna be small. Uh, it's gonna be orbiting on uh, low, uh, low orbit. Um, the main purpose is gonna be Earth imaging and if we have Earth imaging, then we have a high demand for the transmission rate uh, from the uh, satellite to the ground station. So that's why we will uh, implement optical communication link and also quantum communication link, because there is there is an idea, there is a method that um, is actually um, under patenting procedure. Uh, this is the method invented by uh, University of Warsaw and, uh, and my university. Uh, so this is in partnership with Konrad Banaszek, um, which allows for simultaneous uh, quantum and optical uh, communication. So as, as the bits of information fly, we can also establish quantum, quantum key or secure key. Uh, okay, so this is this thing. And actually this, this concludes my uh, my talk and maybe that the last last slide is kind of advertisement. Um, this is the group uh, or let's say part of the group because recently we have uh, new members and there are some openings for motivated postdocs, PhD candidates and, uh, and students. And the projects are related to fundamental science for both theory and experiment, but I would at this moment prefer um, people with um, inclination towards uh, experiment. And there is also optical engineering that can be um, done, uh, can be, how to say, developed uh, in my lab. Okay, um, so that, 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 that concludes my, my talk. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any question that you should have. Okay. Thank you for this uh, clear presentation. So now we have time for questions. Please. Maybe I will start. What is the cost of this cheap satellite, low orbit satellite? Yeah, so uh, if you already have a satellite and if you want to have it on the orbit, so then this is 150, uh, yeah, 150,000 uh, um, US dollars if you want to do that via ISS. So actually the astronauts uh, bring it to ISS and they will push from ISS at, at some point. Um, but there is also a cost of manufacturing uh, small sa satellites. Um, um, the, the, the frame, which they call bus, is of the order of, the, depending on the apparatus that you, that you want to have, but this is also of the order of 100,000 uh, US dollars. Hmm. So yeah, this, this is roughly the budget. Uh, if you want to use everything from the shelf, nice. uh, I would say. Indeed, not so expensive one would expect. No, not really. I, These days it's not really uh, expensive. Uh, could I have you are talking I'm about CubeSat. I'm surprised that so, this is cheap. Yes. So, I'm sure you haven't. Uh, so we have two questions at once, maybe. Um, so I would like to make a short comment that the low end is about 30,000 K. It was project done by students in Krakow. So the, all, the minimal cost is of this order, which is really not so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Just to have a nano satellite in this space. Yeah, yeah. Carol, you are not really giving a 
true numbers. How are you this how supported, the students' projects are tremendously supported by the agency which fired the rockets. Well, not so, quite. In the case of my son, I was supporting him myself. <laughs> Does your son owns the rocket? No, but he bought he bought one cube, uh, one nano satellite, and uh, his uh, students association managed to uh, launch it in this space for such an amount of money. That's that. I'm not questioning this, but the places and the cost of launching a satellite for students, similar to many educational enterprises is heavily subsidized by the owners of those equipment. Okay, okay, but still, the the only I mean, if we are talking about the satellite communication, we are talking about the communication. Yes, yes, but we do agree, we do agree that this is much less than we were thinking. So for the uh, professionals, 100k is not so much. And mm. for students like 30k, it's also doable. They manage to gather such an amount of money. So this is amazing that you can do a lot for not much money. This was the only point I want to make. Maybe other questions? That, that there was uh, actually at least two students' projects. One, one was CrackSat and the other one was PWSAT uh, at some point. And yeah, yeah. they managed to so, do everything from the scratch. I was related to CrackSat in Krakow. <laughs> okay. Um, well, another question. I have a question. I have a question. Yes, please. I have a question concerning what is the time frame for the, when we are talking about the communication, we are basically not so much interested in the special purpose communication. And I understand that all those experiments are not commercial, are not linked to the commercial communication. But what is the, science fiction time frame for which this kind of a communication will become a commercially available for the customers like me for example yeah so um in in europe um we have uh, those but yeah depending we, which kind of communication you mean because in, in europe we have uh, let me ask the question I use a phone. Let me let me put it straight. When I call a friend in Australia using my cell phone, there is there is almost no use of a satellite involved because I most of the communication is still done and because it's faster and cheaper over the under ocean cables, right? Mm -hmm. So the, that's what I mean by the commercial communication. Right, mm -hmm. and uh, what what is the complexity of these arrangements? Because I mean, the the satellites are having a shadows; they disappear from the horizon, exactly. and there must be another one. We have this tremendous problem with the uh, a normal telephone communication networks built on the satellite system. They they don't really work so well. Yeah, so, so, so the use case here is a little bit different. So uh, optical uh, communication is mainly for those applications which uh, demand um, very high um, data rates, like um, uh, um, imaging of the Earth surface or hyperspectral imaging, where there is lots of data that needs to be uh, downloaded uh, from, from the satellite. Uh, this is not actually uh, classical communication like uh, trans transmitting voice or or video. Uh, this is this is not the main um, use case uh, for for these applications. But the, the time frame, um, yeah, there is already running. And that depends on the number of customers. Yeah, that's the point. If it's not the if it's not the commercial operation financed by the commercial users like individuals, that will always be extremely expensive. So, so, so for example, uh, this is the running project by ESA. Uh, so there is already uh, a geo satellite which uh, actually provides this service. So, for example, if one needs 
um, such a service, they can provide. Someone can pay money to, 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 to this company and they will download the data uh, using this, this framework. So this is one, one project. Saga, uh, which is this but project. Itself is financed by the government. It's oh, yeah, not the yeah, commercial. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the point is that we are not talking about the commercial operation. The ESA is not a commercial operation. It's heavily subsidized by the taxpayer. Oh, yeah, and there yeah, is no yeah. the taxpayer to have to... Well, why should anybody else than me pay for my phone calls to Australia? Yeah, so uh, how to say the politics behind ESA is, is problematic. <laughs> I don't want to discuss this because... <laughs> This is a, how to say, longer discussion, uh, but I, I do agree that this is heavily subsidized by tax, ta taxpayers um, because all the projects are financed from the contribution, contributions from each, each country. Uh, but the idea is that in the end that there should be a company which actually will take care of the commercialization. But in Europe, there is three companies uh, who, who can do that. So this is Airbus, OHB, and Thales Alenia. So those are very big uh, companies which can uh, provide uh, the service from the beginning to the end. Uh, so they are, um, how to say, satellite, so-called satellite integrators. So if they see that there is, um, how to say, potential to earn some money, then they will, they will do that. And uh, my personal how to say, opinion is that uh, there, they think that there is going to be uh, a commercial uh, demand or uh, how to say application uh, in a couple of years uh, because this project is actually currently under the, yeah, how to say, active tendering process in, in, in ESA. So I, I cannot say what, what would be the, uh, the time frame. I expect that maybe like five, 10 years, but I'm, I, I'm not sure if there is going to be commercial application for all of the ideas that I presented here. Since I'm the person asking that's the question, let me continue. I mean, why the satellites are important in this whole project? Why not to use this? other issue, I mean, sending uh, balloons, uh, stratospheric balloons, which are, I mean, extremely cheap as compared to satellite. I mean, we, we can use the optical communication with the high flying objects, which are not necessarily satellite. We don't need to, to fire missiles to send the balloons and they, all these electronics can probably be yeah, I mean, it uh, does not depend on the height and the lack of atmosphere or whatever, so. Yeah, but, but one of the use cases here uh, is uh, imaging. So people actually send those satellites in order to take photos of, of a certain parts of, of Earth and then earn money based on those photos. So they, they just sell those photons. And okay. the problem is um, how to do that in the cost effective way in the sense that, uh, okay, so if they want to do that in a cheap way, then um, Leo satellite is the right choice. But then um, with the higher resolution, um, one needs to have a better bandwidth uh, or bigger bandwidth for the transmission of the uh, gathered information, gathered photos from uh, to, to send them from the satellite uh, to the ground station. So this is this is the use case that I believe uh, is going to be commercially available uh, in the very close future. Because, for example, for example, very very big Polish company, which is Exatel, is very interested in the in this uh, in this technology and in in particular in this method of uh, downloading uh, data from from the satellite. Thank you.